as the cannon in this example, it provides enough power and horizontal velocity to the spacecraft on board the second stage that the spacecraft is placed in orbit around the Earth. You'll be able to see this today by watching the orientation of Falcon 9 after liftoff. The rocket will go straight up until about T plus 10 seconds, at which point we begin that shift in orientation by gimbling the engines so Falcon 9 can go horizontally really fast. So be sure to look out for that after liftoff. With about seven and a half minutes left until liftoff, we are joined by NASA's Megan Cruz and ESA's Director General Joseph Oshbacher over at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Hey, Megan, how's it looking over there on the East Coast? Hey, Jesse, welcome everyone to Florida and NASA's Kennedy Space Center. We're just behind us. We are waiting to see Euclid launch on a Falcon 9 rocket right off the launch pad behind us. As you said, joining me this morning is Joseph Oshbacher, the Director General of the European Space Agency. Good to have you here this morning. Glad to be here every time. Yeah, I, I love that you're here. And uh, yeah, just talk to us about uh, how Euclid's launch that we're about to see in a few minutes comes on the heel of a great year for you guys at ESA. Oh, ESA had, uh, had really a fantastic year. We just came out of a ministerial conference conference uh, in November last year, plus 17 percent more budget, uh, many new projects, uh, many new activities, so quite fascinating. Uh, we have selected 17 astronauts. Uh, some of them will fly uh, from here into space. Uh, we have uh, just uh, signed an agreement uh, with Axiom. We're having five astronauts uh, in training right now at the Astronaut Center. We have launched uh, JUICE uh, earlier this year. JUICE is an amazing mission which fits very well with uh, Euclid, uh, which is looking uh, at habitability of the icy moons of Jupiter, something quite unimaginable, just uh, as crazy as uh, Euclid, uh, dark matter, dark energy, which is uh, really amazing. So we have a lot to do. We have uh, space summit coming up uh, towards the end of the year where we want to raise the profile of space in Europe uh, to top level politicians and to see what Europe needs to do to really be a strong space power also to our partners in America. Right. Mm -hmm. And and in order to foster that uh, the space industry, I mean, one of the reasons you really want to do that is to also address a global issue that we here at NASA really care about as well. Oh, yes, we do. We have many satellites that look at our planet. Uh, climate change is the largest problem on our planet for many decades to come, if not centuries, and we need to do everything we can from space. Uh, we have the Copernicus program, we have Meteo program, we have just launched uh, MTG-1 uh, uh, last year, fantastic images uh, that uh, just came out, uh, and we really make sure that we use our space assets to the best of humankind, uh, and climate change is one of our big concerns. Uh, and one, one uh, element which we just launched is uh, not only on ground that we want to see at climate change, also in space. Uh, and I'm about to really initiate a, a zero debris uh, charter where we would like to encourage people worldwide to uh, not pollute our orbits. Uh, that means uh, if you put a satellite up, you put it down at the end of its lifetime. And that's a new initiative we are doing. Great. And any words for all the scientists that are hoping to really learn a lot from this Euclid mission? Oh, the incredible science will come out. I'm pretty sure some Nobel Prizes will be won based on this data. This is really a fascinating mission. I'm so happy. I thank my community, my member states, industry, NASA also as a partner, and all the contributors to this. And thank you so much for this contribution. Well, congrats to you, and I can't wait to see Euclid launch. Thank you. Thank you so much. Back to Hawthorne. Thanks, Megan. We are about T minus four minutes and 40 seconds away from liftoff. And at this point in the countdown, the clamp arms are going to begin to open up beneath the fairing, and then the transporter erector will begin to attract away from the vehicle in preparation Strive for launch. Strive retract has started. And there we heard that call out. And you can see the clamp arms just below the fairing there on your screen. Those should begin to open shortly here. Once those are fully open, then the transporter erector, or what you heard called the strong back, uh, will retract away from the vehicle. And there you can see the clamp arms opening up there. Again, once those are fully open, the TE will begin to slowly retract away from the vehicle. And it is very slow and slight, but the TE is now beginning to move away from the vehicle. At this point in the countdown, both the first and second stages are nearly fully loaded with 1 million pounds of kerosene fuel and liquid oxygen. Both first stage and second stage should finish prop loading about a minute apart from each other. First stage finishing up at T minus three minutes and second stage at T minus two minutes. At T minus 60 seconds, Falcon 9 will be in startup. Now what that means is the rocket's autonomous internal flight computers will have taken over the launch countdown. Just inside of T minus two seconds, we light the Merlin 1D engines for liftoff. The 
Euclid payload continues to be healthy and the Falcon 9 team is tracking no issues on the rocket. Currently, both the vehicle and payload are healthy. Stage one lock slot is complete. And we're looking good for an on-time liftoff at 11, 12 a.m. Eastern time. So let's send it back to Megan over there in Florida. Hey, Jesse, you can start to feel the energy here at NASA's Kennedy Space Center. We're just behind us. We are waiting to watch the Euclid spacecraft launch atop of Falcon 9, again, on the launch pad right behind us. So with me now is Carol Mundell. She is ESA's Director of Science. Really great to have you here today. Hi, Megan. Great to join you. So talk to me about why uh, studying dark matter, dark energy, why is that so important to understanding our universe? Yeah, sure. This is one of the biggest unsolved problems in modern physics. So we actually think we understand only 5% of the universe, mm. uh, with the matter that we see, galaxies, stars, planets, ourselves. So 95% of the universe, dark matter and dark energy, is still a mystery and enigma, a huge frontier of modern physics that we hope this mission will actually help to push forward. Mm -hmm. So then how do you go about detecting things we can't see? Yeah, it's a great question. And of course, this sense of darkness really comes from the fact that dark matter does exert gravitational pull. So we see the effect of it. We look at galaxies and they spin too quickly for the number of stars and the amount of gas they have. We look at the clusters of galaxies in the universe and we see too much mass. And so we don't know what fills that mass. It might be mm. exotic particles. It might be that we've got our equations wrong. And on top of that, our universe is expanding. Mm. But the really big mystery for modern physics is that that, that expansion is accelerating. So it's actually getting faster and we don't know why. Our equations don't tell the whole story. Mm. And so what this mission will do is it will map all of that out to 10 billion years back in history wow. and hopefully tell us the, the answer to the mystery of life, the universe, and everything. So then really quick, when do we expect to get this data back to start really analyzing it. Yeah, so this is a six-year mission, and the first three months of the mission will actually be calibrating the data because this is a, a huge feat of engineering technology. We have very, very precise images across all of the extragalactic sky, and then scientists around the world, we have 2,500 scientists in Europe and in the U.S. across nine data centers will analyze these data all the way through six years. So our final cosmology answers will come at the end of the six years, but we'll, we'll do lots of exciting science along the way as well. Carol, thank you so much. Very exciting. Thank you. Thanks, Megan. Thanks, Megan. We are just under one minute. Falcon 9 is in startup, and we are just waiting for the final go for launch. LD, go for launch. And great news. All systems are go for launch of Falcon 9 and ESA's Euclid Space Telescope. T minus 30 seconds and counting. Fifteen seconds and counting. T minus ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Did you miss him? Step back. Stage one propulsion is nominal. Vehicle is pitching down range. Falcon 9 has successfully lifted off from pad 40 and throttled down to prepare for max Q, which is coming up at T plus one minute. Power and telemetry nominal. One minute and about 12 seconds. Max Q is the highest amount of aerodynamic pressures. That's the largest structural load that the vehicle will see on ascent. We throttle down those engines just to pass through max Q, and then we'll throttle them back up once we pass through that period. Falcon 9 is supersonic. Maximum dynamic pressure. And great news. We have passed through Max Q, getting some excellent views there on your screen. Next up, we have a few events happening back to back. That will be MECO stage separation and SES 1. MECO is main engine cutoff, and that's where we'll shut down all nine of the M1D engines to slow the vehicle down in preparation for its next event, which is MVEC chill has started. Stage separation. 
And that's where the first stage separates from the second stage. Right after stage separation, the first stage will begin its journey back to Earth for landing on our drone ship, a short fall of Gravitas. And during that time, stage two will continue on its journey with that third event, SES-1 or second stage engine start one. And that is where the single Merlin vacuum engine will light up and propel the second stage along with ESA's Euclid spacecraft to orbit. In addition to these three major events, the fairing halves will separate less than a minute after SES-1, so keep an eye out for all of those events coming up here in just about 15 seconds or so. Again, coming up, we have MECO stage separation and SES-1. Main engine cutoff. Stage separation confirmed. And back ignition. Some really cool views of Miko stage separation, and on your right-hand screen, you can see that the MVAC engine has ignited. Both vehicles are following nominal trajectories. On your left-hand screen, the grid fins on the first stage are deploying. And in about 15 seconds or so, we should have fairing separation. And a very cool view from the ground. Fairing separation confirmed. And there you can see on your right-hand screen that the fairing halves have deployed. Now, as I mentioned previously, both fairing halves are brand new and are now making their way back down to Earth and will be recovered by our recovery vessel, Doug, today. It is T plus four minutes into today's mission. And in order to complete today's landing, the first stage has two more burns left. Next up is the entry burn, and that's where three of the Merlin 1D engines will reignite. This helps to slow the vehicle down as it re-enters the upper parts of the Earth's atmosphere. Now that entry burn is coming up in about a couple minutes from now, and that entry burn will last about 20 seconds long. And what you're looking at on your screen, on your left-hand side is a view from the first stage vehicle, currently making its way back down to Earth, which you can see in the background, and on your right-hand screen is a view from the second stage looking aft at our MVAC engine. Acquisition of signal, Bermuda. That entry burn is coming up here just about a minute and a half. Both vehicles now. continue to follow nominal trajectories. And good call-outs there. On the bottom of your screen, you can see the speed and altitude of each vehicle as well. And on your left-hand screen, you can see two of the four hypersonic grid fins that the first stage has. Those grid fins help guide the vehicle as it makes its way back to its landing zone. Again, today we are scheduled to land on a shortfall of Gravitas, currently in the Atlantic Ocean waiting for the first stage vehicle. And on your screen, you're getting a great view from the second stage with the M back there and the Earth looking amazing in the background. We're just about 20 seconds away from the entry burn on the first stage vehicle. You may see some white puffs on that first stage. That is nitrogen gas puffs for attitude control. Stage one FTS has saved. And there you can see the engines have reignited on the first stage on your left hand screen. This is the entry burn with three of nine M1D engines reignited.
And you can see that those engines have shut down. That concludes the entry burn for the first stage. Now we do have one more burn for the first stage vehicle as it attempts to land on our drone ship, and that is the landing burn. It will just be a single engine, the center E9 engine reigniting, and that is enough thrust to help slow down the vehicle to enable it to touch down on our drone ship. Now during the first stage landing burn, uh, excuse me, the vehicle will be landing for its second time. Stage two FTS is saved. Stage two terminal guidance. vehicle will be landing for its second time today. And just before the landing burn begins, we will also have SECO-1 on the second stage. That is second engine cutoff one. That's where we'll shut down that MVAC engine on the second stage. This is the first of two burns for this mission. And that is coming up here in just a few seconds, followed by the landing burn about 20 seconds after that. There you can see that the MVAC engine has shut down and the landing burn has begun on the first stage vehicle. Expected loss of signal, Cape. Nominal orbit insertion. What an incredible clear view of Falcon 9 touching down on a short fall of Gravitas. This landing marks the second successful landing for this particular booster and marks our 204th overall successful recovery of an orbital class rocket, including both Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy first stages. We also heard the call out for SECO-1 and confirmation of good orbit. So with confirmation of a successful second engine cutoff and first stage landing, we are going to be in a coast phase until just before the second relight of our MVAC engine on the second stage, which will be followed by payload deploy. So sit tight and we'll see you back here around the T plus 17 minute mark. Thank you. 